But first up, the Trump administration amped up its efforts today against illegal immigration. The Department of Homeland Security announced a new set of rules that substantially expand the number of illegal immigrants prioritized for deportation from this country. Advocates for illegal immigrants say the rules are a blueprint for mass deportations. But one expert thinks the real victim of the new rules will be the American economy. Alex Narasta is an immigration policy analyst for the Cato Institute here in Washington. He's a libertarian think tank. He's a supporter of more immigration, and he joins us now. Alex, thanks a lot for coming on. Thanks for having me. So I think most Americans are pretty for immigrants and immigration. Famously, we're all descended from immigrants. The question is of scale. So we have about maybe 14% of the population currently out of 325 billion is foreign born. And it's either at or maybe a little above a historic high. So we've got a ton. There are four times as many foreign-born people in this country as there were when I was born in 1969. And so the question becomes, how many is enough and how many is too many, would you say? Is there, what's the ideal level of immigration? Well, I think the ideal level is determined by the market. It's determined by the free economy much more than it's determined by bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. So when we look around the world at countries like Canada, 20% of their population is foreign-born. Australia, it's 28%. And Switzerland, it's over 30%. And those countries have uh, very nice governing economies, very rich countries, large rates of economic growth. So whatever that magic number is, it can't be determined by the government, but it's probably higher than what it is today. Okay, so if more immigration makes you richer, then why is the American middle class getting poorer? Well, we've seen a lot of the people uh, in the United States that are suffering are those that are not really competing uh, with immigrants directly. It's really people who are competing indirectly with immigrants that are doing poorly. So, for instance, let me put it this way. There's never been an economy in world history that's done better with fewer people. And increasing the size of the labor force, increasing the number of people who are entrepreneurs, who are investors, who are scientists, who are consumers here of goods and services actually helps the U.S. grow. But we're not, obviously, we're not importing software coders and investors. We're importing people who happen to be nearby who are taking overwhelmingly the low-end jobs. But, but that doesn't get to the question I asked, which is, you pointed to Canada and Switzerland as examples of countries that have a lot of immigrants and are rich, suggesting there's a connection. So we have way more immigrants than we did when I was born, but the middle class is poorer, in fact, dying younger than it was. So clearly, it's not working for them. Well, based on the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, the middle class is wealthier if you take a look at the 50th percentile based on the 1970s. But actually, the number one country sending immigrants to the U.S. today are China and India, and those are overwhelmingly higher-skilled people not, than Mexico. Not by, not by volume, not by numbers. Oh, yeah, by, by numbers since about uh, 2008, 2009, Mexico has dropped off, and Hispanic countries are actually in the third tier for the number of new immigrants. We've witnessed, in essence, since the transformation of this country from Hispanic immigration to now East and South Asian immigrants who are coming in. Okay, but you still, uh, you still haven't gotten to the core question, which is there is a sense in which, a real sense in which the economy is not working for the bulk of Americans. It's why Trump got elected. There's been a massive generation of wealth, but it's adhered mostly to the top end. As you know, there's kind of no dispute sure. about that. I don't think there's a coincidence that that's occurred at a time when we have massive immigration because this level of immigration is good for people at the top end but not for the middle. Well, we had ma more massive immigration as a percentage of the population in terms of the annual flows in the 1990s when we had a much greater and faster growing economy than we did during the 2000s. I mean, the thing really holding back the U.S. economy today are high taxes and regulations. I mean, the flow of immigrants into the country, if you include like illegal immigrants, for instance, coming in annually, is less than it was uh, before the Great Recession annually coming in. So as a result of that, uh, it actually goes in favor of my point, which is the f more immigrants, the faster the growth. <laughs> but okay, this is what I find hilarious about libertarians. So they're very much into the market, of course, as you are. Aren't you? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, to some extent, yes. It's not a religion for me, though. But I believe in supply and demand because I think it is an iron law of nature, right? And so do libertarians, except when it comes to immigration. So they say, well, immigration, low-wage immigration has no effect on wages at the bottom end of our economy. But if you have an overabundance of something, a surfeit of something, it's volume, it's, it's price falls, right? That's why sand is cheap. Yeah. But that's not true for immigration. It doesn't affect wages for American workers. Of course it does. So it does affect w wages for American workers, but immigrants, because they're people, also boost demand when they come here. So it's not just an increase in supply. It's also an increase in demand because you have more people buying things here in the United States. Yeah, but it means that the average person without a college degree, for example, makes less. That's the whole point of immigration because it, it's a source of cheap labor for employers. Like, why don't you admit that? Actually, when you look at the research by George Borjas at Harvard, who is the most famous skeptic of immigration's benefits to the United States, 
least it's only Americans with less than a high school degree who are see uh, negative effects of uh, immigration on well, their wages. And they're, and they're less than 10% of the population. Meanwhile, the other 90% of Americans, including those in the middle class, actually see wage increases oh, as a result of, course of immigration. Because if I'm competing with someone who's willing to work for less, that, that my wages go up, right? Well, no, because Americans who are middle class, who have some college or a college education, are not competing against immigrants who speak no English and have less than a high school degree. Okay. I mean, it's the same sense like you're not going to be competing against an illegal Mexican immigrant for your job because they don't speak English. No, they're going to be mowing my lawn and doing my laundry. And that raises the second concern, which is, are you worried that the United States has become a country where all the crappy work is done by foreigners? And doesn't that set up a weird kind of surf economy that exacerbates, among other things, race relations? It's, it, how is that good if we import people to do our dirty work? Why is that, does that increase our dignity, do you think? I don't think it increases our dignity, but I don't think that's any different than it was uh, in during the late 19th century or <laughs> right, early 20th exactly. century or early when you had Italians. Earlier 19th century. Well, when you had people who voluntarily came here and decided to work, and then their kids did better and their kids assimilated, that's been part of the story of America from the beginning. And that is what's happening today with the descendants of Hispanic and Asian immigrants, as well as those folks today who are adding to our economy, working and improving their lives voluntarily, and their kids are doing well. You say they're adding to our economy, but there's no question that illegal immigrants, for example, consume more in public services than they pay in in taxes. I mean, it's like two to one. So, like, why is it in our interest, our being like a middle class American who's not employing cheap labor, to continue that? Why are we paying to subsidize cheap labor for big companies, which we're doing? Well, we absolutely shouldn't be paying welfare benefits. I don't want to pay welfare benefits to anybody. And we definitely shouldn't be paying them to immigrants, illegal or otherwise. But the way that the law currently is right now is uh, legal immigrants don't have access to welfare benefits for the first five years that they're here. And true. illegal immigrants, illegal immigrants don't have access to means such welfare benefits either. Most of the studies would purport to, right, most of the studies would purport to show that count their family members who are born in the no, U.S. as that's, consuming a welfare no, benefit. Under federal law, and the Obama administration, by the way... This is very slippery. You're no, not the Obama, telling the truth. No, the Obama administration actually prosecuted states that accidentally uh -huh. gave welfare okay. benefits to illegal Look, immigrants you, to get their money This back. is sophistry, because what you're excluding is the, the, the non-welfare, but in effect, public benefits mm -hmm. that any, <coughs> I beg your pardon, anyone who lives in this country gets, including health care, the use of infrastructure, schooling, all of that is subsidized. And the truth is that immigrants, legal and illegal, at the bottom end of the labor scale, consume more than they pay in. They are, and I'm not saying they're not good people, sure. but they are a net cost to the country, to taxpayers. So like, recent, why should we put up with that? The recent National Academy of Sciences study took a look at low-skilled immigrants with less than a high school degree who come in before the age of 24 and found that their net fiscal impact is positive, meaning that they pay more in taxes than they consume in benefits for that group of but people you know coming that in. That's not, however, that's, however, that's, we that's just not look, true. Well, when you take, well, the National Academy of Sciences, which is the most <laughs> I mean, extensive just, study just ever put together, does that. And when you take a look at the peer-reviewed evidence on this, immigrants about pay their own way in terms of the fiscal state. But when you even drill down into states like Texas, for instance, Texas state report found in 2006 that illegal immigrants pay more in the state coffers than they take out because Texas has small welfare benefits and everybody gets taxed. But that's no because they're counting welfare. Look, you know that's not true. If a family of five moves to the country, two parents are working for minimum wage, three kids uh, being educated mm -hmm. at public expense, mm -hmm. they do not pay more in taxes than they take out of the public treasury. That's just not true, and you know it's not and true. And if we count it by those standards, then it never makes sense for any American to ever have any kids because it's a fiscal drain. You also have to call the taxes that those kids pay when they grow up and then they start paying taxes and working in the United States. Not, if minimum, you, if we not, a, not at minimum wage. That, we, that does but, not but, work, but their actually. kids actually pay, okay. make a lot more than minimum wage. So let me, ask you a a let me ask you a philosophical question. The Trump administration says, look, you commit a crime here and you're an illegal alien, mm -hmm. like we have a moral right to deport you. And you're in effect arguing against that. Why no, don't no, we no. have that I, right? I think that if you commit a violent or property offense, if you, infringe, if you infringe upon the rights of another American through your actions, then you should absolutely be deported. But I'm not going to your presence is an infringement upon my right not to pay for you as not even a citizen? Well, that's a great argument against uh, all types of things, and we—that's a great argument, argument against, against the illegal welfare immigrant. State. That's a great argument against the welfare but, but, state, and I would think that a conservative would be more opposed to the welfare state than against the free flow of people across borders. You know what, I'm, be, you know what I'm in favor of, of and why I don't work in a think tank. I'm in favor of acknowledging reality as it is, mm -hmm. and the truth is, we have an overarching welfare state that's not only not going away; it's expanding, and you know that, and you're not going to change. We significantly it. So under those circumstances, in the past, we have not stopped ever illegal immigration. We are in no position. We're on the horizon. There is no point where we're going to reduce. 
benefits to Americans, period. People said that before bigger, in 1996, look, too. And, 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 you're, and they were wrong. Until we eliminate the welfare state, why in the world will we bring people in here in an open border scheme that you espouse? Because immigrants, on average, have a better fiscal impact. They pay more on taxes than they consume in benefits, and they don't have access to welfare when they come in these countries, not which true. is not com true compared to Europe and other countries. Okay. I mean, if you're here on a green card, you don't have access to means tested welfare for five years. If you're an illegal immigrant, you but don't you're have access using to the, welfare the benefits. fruits of society you, that the rest of us pay for, and there's an actual cost to that. Ask anybody whose kids go to a school where no one speaks English or needs health care in an emergency room. That's I went a to real school thing. in Southern California too, and I experienced a lot of those things. But the benefit, that the way to solve those problems is to legalize those folks, to give them a way right. to path to citizenship, and then to cut right. a lot of public services. Alex, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Spirited conversation.